In this lecture, we are going to see how we can design a simple computer. Indeed, for the real computers, the data pass actions are determined by a program which is loaded and running. So, the program is indeed developed by a user and then it is loaded into a computer and then the data pass is performing the operations based on that program. But in order to understand for the data pass to understand that program which comes from the user, a control unit is needed. The control unit is responsible for generating the correct control signals for the data pass, which are obviously based on the program code, which is uh, indeed for the which is indeed uh, provided for the control unit in turn. Over here, you can see a block diagram of a processor. We have the data pass here. Then the control unit stays here, which generates the control signals for the data pass and it receives status signals from the data pass. You should remember that the status bits that we had were the overflow, negative, carry and zero. On the other hand, the control unit also receives the program from the user. So basically, the main uh, tasks for the control unit is that it converts the program instructions into control words for the data pass. And the control word, we already know that, includes the signals write, D, A, 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 B, A, so data address, A address, B address, M, B, fs which is function select memory write and md for the multiplexer it executes the program instruction in the correct sequence so the program instruction should be executed correctly in a sequence in a given sequence one after the other one and it also generates the constant input for the data pass so depending on the instruction sometimes the data pass would need to receive some constant input and that constant values will be generated by the control unit as well. So over here, it's also again mentioned that the data pass will send the information back to the control unit. And these informations are the V, C, N and Z signals, the status bits that will be sent back to the control unit. And then based on them, the control uh, unit may take some actions in terms of determining which will be the next instruction to execute, whether to proceed to the next one or whether to jump over a part of the code. That would also be dependent on the, the program code which is developed by the user. Well, we are going to use the Harvard architecture, which means that we will assume that there are two memory units, one for the instruction memory and the other one for the data memory. The instruction memory will hold the program and the data memory will be used for the computations. The, the main advantage of this architecture is that uh, in a single clock cycle, we can read an instruction and load or store data in the data run. Okay, so we have access to, let's say, two separate memories, memory units, the instruction RAM and the data RAM. Over here, you can see in block diagram form the, the memory units for the instruction RAM and for the data RAM. For simplicity, for the instruction RAM, we don't show any write or data input for the instruction, which are obviously needed yeah, if you want to load the program into the instruction RAM. But for the data RAM, we show them. We show the memory write. We show the input address data, the address input, data input, and the output which is used for the data. Uh, it's also good, in, good to keep in mind that for the modern CPUs, the caches often feature a Harvard art architecture similar to what we have here. But there's also usually a single main memory which holds both program instructions and data in a von Neumann architecture, which is another architecture. The program counter 
or PC for short. So PC is here not personal computer, but the program counter. It addresses the instruction memory. Okay, so here we have the instruction memory. And then a PC, a program counter, which is a, which is a counter, as you can see, it addresses the instruction memory. Therefore, the address input for the instruction memory receives data from the program counter. It's a counter, so it might start as 001, then 002. Uh, just a moment. Not 002, obviously, but... 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, and it could continue like this. Or we can also include 0, 0, 0, 0. Okay? So it's in the form of a counter, but each value here, it will determine an address in the instruction RAM. And it will be used in order to keep track of the instruction currently being executed. So in the instruction RAM, we will have a set of instructions stored and for each instruction there will be an address and then the program counter will determine by providing the address which instruction should be executed but then for the program counter we also have two inputs the load input and the data input when load is equal to one the program counter will be updated with the data which is at input side so if load is enabled for the program counter its content will be updated similar to what we have for the regular counters yeah but when load is equal to zero the program counter will increment its content and then the next instruction in the memory will be executed but while uh, the new data is written into the program counter the data will will represent some address specified in a jump or branch instruction so instead of Moving, let's say, from uh, 0010 0, 0 to 0011, 0, 0, 1, which is obviously incrementing, when load becomes equal to 1, we might jump to 1000, 0, 0, 0, the content of the program count. And it determines where the next instruction to be executed. We also have the instruction decoder, which receives data from the instruction RAM. So as already mentioned, instruction RAM stores the instructions in a given in the given addresses. Yeah? It's in the form of a RAM. So the data which is in, stored inside it will be decoded using an instruction decoder. Instruction decoder is basically a combinational circuit which makes the which takes the machine language instruction which is stored inside the instruction RAM and then it will produce the matching control signals for the data pass. You can see the control signals which are needed by the data pass. Yeah? D A A A B A M B function select M D write and memory write. These will be generated using the instruction decoder. And these signals will tell the data pass which registers or memory locations to access and what ALU operations to perform by what we have in the FSC, for example. We also have the branch control unit. So here we have the branch control unit, which is determined, which is used in order to determine what will be the next value for the program counter, yeah? whether it should be incremented or whether it should be loaded by new data. And you can see over here that we have the, this is indeed the load input to the program counter, and this is the data input. These are provided by the branch control, and then the program counter provides the address for the instruction RAM, and it is also used by the branch control. So when load is equal to zero, again, program counters content will be incremented. When it's equal to one, that new data will be written into the program counter, which is provided by the branch control. On the other hand, the branch control receives these status bits, which come from the 
data paths V, C, N, and Z, and it is also receiving input from the instruction decoder. So branch control will be indeed active when we have jumps and branch instructions. We will see more about the jumps and branch inst instructions later. Uh, but whenever we have the jump or the branch, the program counter will be loaded with the with some address. In the case of jumps, it will be loaded with the target address specified in, in the instruction. And in the case of branch, the program counter will be loaded with the target address only if the corresponding status piece bit is true. So it will depend in the case of branch for branch instructions, it will also depend on the status bits. And if uh, we don't have any jump or branch instruction, then the content of the program counter will be incremented by one. And in, in some sense, that's all that we have for the control unit. So here you can see the very basic control unit. We have the branch control, the program counter, the instruction RAM, and the instruction decoder. These are constructing our control unit, which then could be used together with the data pass in order to construct our simple computer. So on each clock cycle, an instruction is read from the instruction memory. Then the instruction decoder generates the matching data pass control word that you can see over here. Then data pass registers are read and sent to the ALU or to the data memory and ALU or RAM outputs are written back to the register file and then the program counter is incremented or reloaded by new data for branches and jumps. And over here you can see the whole pro processor. We have the control unit and the data pass. Control unit generates these signals for the data pass. Data pass receives them. As you can see here, D, A, 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 B, A, M, B, F, S, then right here, and then memory, right? These are provided by the control unit for the data pass, and then the data pass sends V, C, N, and Z back to the control unit, as you can see over here. Uh, we just need to also show that the register file has the D input, data input as well, which comes from the multiplexer that we have over here. The constant value we see later that it also is provided by the control unit. We will see how it is done, how indeed the control unit can provide the constant value for the data pass, but in general this will be the the structure of a simple process.